Please join me in our call to worship. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. The mountains shake and the waters foam. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. Be still and know that I am God. Our hymn is number 247, Built on the Rock. Would you stand and sing with us, Built on the Rock? I'd like to invite the children to come down and have a seat on the steps. We have a picture presentation for you. Um, also, I would like all of the adults who helped with VBS um, in any way at all to come forward. You all can sit on the steps or you can sit in the first two pews. Uh, this week was an incredible week, and I was blown away uh, by everything I saw in our vacation Bible school and more than anything else, I was blown away by the showing of help that we had and just how people continue to pour out their time and their resources to help us. Um, it was amazing. And let me tell you, the children had a wonderful time, but most importantly, I think they learned a lot. Um, and they were able to be loved on this week, and they were able to learn a lot about the Bible and learn a lot about Jesus and God. And so it was just a fantastic week. Um, and so I want to thank our adults for helping and for just being so willing to, like I said, pour out their time and their resources. And one quick note, if anyone else would like to pitch in, <laughs> um, we still need some help. Uh, the entire children's wing is decorated like a kingdom, and that cannot remain. <laughs> and so the kingdom needs to crumble. So if you would like to help us take that down. Uh, we're having a teardown day tomorrow from 
10 to 12. Not all of it's coming down, she said. Some will remain. Part of Humpty Dumpty will fall, not all of him. So if you all can help, we would be um, so grateful for that. And so I hope you enjoy the pictures that we have uh, and just to kind of get a glimpse into the week that we had together. You know, there's something really sweet about seeing children worship God, and I'm, get, I'm coming to tears thinking about it. We had a couple of moments um, in VBS this week where they were learning new worship songs, and boy, I tell you what, it was like the demeanor of the entire room changed, and I didn't want it to end, and we were on a schedule, and it had to, but um, it was incredible what happened this week. It really was, and it was beautiful, and you know, we want that to continue in our children's ministry. It's growing and it's thriving. And so we thank you all for supporting us. And uh, thank you guys for coming. And thank you all for helping so much this week. We really appreciate it.
Let us pray together. What a week it has been. For many of us, we got to see young people enthralled with hearing your stories, of learning about you, of learning how you walk with us through life's ups and downs, finding faith, growing in strength, and what a joy it is to be around those who are just beginning to understand you, Lord and what you do for us, and how you made us. For the rest of us, we didn't get to be a part of that, but we've had other things that we are thankful for, Lord. So many blessings along the way, some that we have missed, some that we have recognized, but blessings every day. And we are thankful, Lord. Help us be even more thankful as we recognize the goodness that you place all around. At other times this week, we've faced challenges, too many to name in a congregation this size. Some of us received some bad news. Some of us started treatments. Some of us have problems with those that we love. Some of us just feel lonely or sad or grieving, and we know that you are there with us through it all, Lord. Help us turn to you in our time of need. Help us open ourselves to your strength and your power in our lives, and help us yield our very lives to you. Today we pray for those that are mentioned in our bulletin and for Jim and for Pat and for Norma and for Bobby. And there are so many more. We bring our request to you, Lord, because we know you care. And we know that when we bring you our troubles that we can relax, that we can cease to worry because we remember it doesn't do us any good anyway. But when we place our troubles in your hands, we thank you, Lord, that you care and that you constantly work in our lives to bring us peace and joy and comfort and strength. We pray for our church during this time of transition. We thank you for this team that has been called out to seek and to find the next person who will lead our church into the future. We pray for our church and we pray for the decisions that we will make in the, in the future, even in the near future. Help us be the people that you are calling us to be, to walk boldly into the future you have laid out for us. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture this morning is taken from the seventh chapter of Matthew, verses 24 to 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This is the word of the Lord. Which is more powerful? What life brings to us or what we bring to life? How you answer those questions is what differentiates people. St. Paul might have had that in mind in Romans, the familiar text. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. I leave off that first part, and what's left is preposterous. Everybody knows that all things don't work together for good. But St. Paul believed that those who loved God, for them, in any given circumstance, they have available to them the spirited interior attitude of love to prevail over anything. Do you realize the power of that? What happens to us from without can blow us up. But the outcome depends on what is in us to explode. And that makes what goes on in here far more crucial than what goes on out there. And that's why we have churches where we cultivate the strengths of soul and spirit. This is not a new revelation. 2,000 years ago, a Christian missionary knew that if anything works for good in anybody's life, it's because they had the determination to make it good. What makes life good? Having wealth, getting high, party, 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 winning the lottery. See, finding life worth living isn't automatic. It has to be made good. Some of it, a lot of it, I guess, is luck. But any worthwhile progress in life comes from free initiative. We're free to deal with the challenges we face. Otherwise, we'll just be one more victim. Or we think somebody ought to bail us out of the messes we get ourselves into. We see a lot of that going on today. Does it make life good? I wonder. Nobody bailed Paul out. Although he begged for God to bail him out, three times he prayed that God would remove this thorn in his side that had been plaguing him. Look, God, I'm your huckleberry, you know. Do something for me every now and then. But God said his grace is sufficient. Few have faced more hardships than the apostle. 
He spent a lot of time in jail. But while he was there, he didn't just do time. He made good use of it. I would have you know, said he, that what happened to me has been for the greater progress of the gospel. Not a hint of bitterness, not a word of protest about life being unfair, nothing about somebody owes me something for nothing. Lock him up in jail, and what does he do? He writes letters that became the most widely read literature in Holy Writ. What an indomitable spirit was he, worshipped as a god, stoned as a felon, shipwrecked thrice, loved as a brother, hated as a heretic, imprisoned as a miscreant. Few men in all history other than Jesus himself have suffered more hardship and deserve to be listened to as this man who said, for those who love God, everything works for good. And yet this guy who has been assaulted with one awful experience after the other that few people could face and overcome because of his faith, this inner strength he had, he believed that all of that works together for his good because his ability to manage himself facilitated it. And what life did to him depended on what life found in him when it did it. Put him in a barrel, he'd come out preaching through the bunghole. The word defeat was no place in his vocabulary because he had this inner strength to view what was done to him as part of his calling from God. Our faith teaches us that we can change any situation by our internal attitude about it. Love God, all things work for good. Or you're as rich as you perceive yourself to be. Or you may be dirt poor. It's all in your perception of it. The hardest challenges have to be whipped on the inside. Those are the toughies. Crutches are fine for a broken leg, but they can't touch a broken heart. There is stubborn power in the human will for good or ill. But God believes that we have it in us to whip whatever fate deals to us. The question is, can we believe it? That's the hard part. Trusting God's promise, who said he won't tempt us beyond our limitations to withstand it. My daddy taught me not to play the kind of sports where you hit a ball and chase it yourself. He said, you play the sports that you hit a ball and let somebody else chase it. Well, you knew I don't like golf. <laughs> so I grew up, though, loving team sports. Not individual sports, but, but team competition. And, and that's how I learned to deal with disappointment. That's where I learned how to lose. That's where I learned the value of playing in spite of an injury. Bob Lambert was my football coach. He started out at Madisonville, and my junior year moved to Etowah. Great coach, loved him to death. Great inspiration in my life. Taught me many lessons that I still carry with me to this day. One day, we were practicing football, and I sprained my ankle. We were blocking punts, and I came down on the wrong side, and that thing twisted. It didn't break, but I wish it had, <laughs> because it swelled up that big, so big, the next day I couldn't even get my shoe on. So it came to time to dress out for practice, and I decided, uh, if I can't walk, then why go out and practice? And that's when Coach Lambert came in and said, what are you doing? I said, I can't walk. I sprained my ankle. 
And he said, well, put it on and go out there and play, play anyway. You know, it never dawned on me that I could do that until I did it. Did it hurt? Yeah, it hurt, but I did it. Learning to play hurt was one of the most important lessons in my life because ever since those heady high school days, I can count on both hands the days I wasn't hurting somewhere, so you better learn to play hurt. Now that was a long time ago. And the older I get, the more the hurt. <laughs> and I still am learning to play hurt. And I never forgot that. Never forgot about learning to play hurt, but I've often forgotten the philosophy behind it, what the compulsions of life do to us depends on what they find in us. Church reminds us that life is greater than how we feel about it on any given day. At church, we deal with what makes life worth living. Life's worth living if you're lucky or famous or powerful or popular or born with white privilege. What about those who have to try harder because of their position? What about those who have to try harder because they're genetically afflicted or unlucky or disadvantaged, let alone those who do themselves in? There's plenty of that. Yet we see that those with those circumstances can still make their lives worthwhile too. That's St. Paul. That's Jesus. Or I know you're thinking, I love God. Then nothing bad ought to happen to me. That's poor theology, but that's the way we think. What about those who love God and nothing turns out good? Does that mean the scripture is wrong? I think it means give it time. Give time, time. Give God time. The God who gives life to the dead, can he not also bring good out of evil? Is that not the theology of the cross that stands at the center of our faith? It falls to none of us to determine whether something is good or not. It's not our job. Our job is to love God and leave the results to what he has seen fit to give to us. Church helps us do that. Now, if you could draw a line through the entire human race, just draw a line through it, and have the fortunate ones on this side and the unfortunate ones, sorry y'all, on that side, most of us would say that those who find life worth living are those who are on the fortunate side of life. This stands to reason. But not if Jesus is our model. Keep going back to Jesus. Fortunate. <laughs> A carpenter by trade with no place to lay his head, falsely tried and crucified, fortunate. St. Paul overcomes tremendous setbacks and never once did he ever think of quitting. Why did he not just walk away from it, the abuse he got from his churches? Not once did he ever contemplate. It didn't even cross his mind. I'm giving this up. Fortunate. Helen Keller, a blind woman with more vision than people who can see. Dr. King inspired a nation to rely on its better angels. What side of the line would they be on? These have not sat in the pampered seats of a life on easy street. Fortunate, yet it never held them back. They were great. Why? because they rose above their circumstances. They were bigger than what life did to them by strength of soul and tenacity of spirit that's just as real as money or luck or looks. Things that we think make life worthwhile. The Australian Aborigines have these neat things, boomerangs, and they've learned uh, constructing these pieces of stick that it's like a V, 
They can throw it out, and it comes back to them. It's mechanically constructed to return to cinder. Now, let a homing pigeon loose, and what? It returns too. But a homing pigeon has a mysterious inner gyroscope that a boomerang doesn't have. And then let a prodigal son leave home with his inheritance in tow, and there he learns the hard way what it's like being lost in the far country, and he may or may not return home. No guarantees with a son, nothing mechanically programmed with a son, but that troubled young man had something inside of him that neither boomerang nor homing pigeon has, the freedom to endure what cannot be avoided. Playing hurt. He wallowed around in the pig pens till he had his fill, but still had something, enough of his old man left inside of him to get his mind right. And what does Luke say? He says he came to himself. Don't we need to see more of that? A lot of our being lost is we're not ourselves. We're not where we belong. He didn't belong in the pig pens. He came to himself and what did he say? I will arise. That's what I'm talking about. I will arise out of this slop bucket and go back home to my father where I belong. That's how we turn our bad decisions into something good. Nobody did it for him. He had to do it himself. We rise above our stupefying surroundings that some people have a knack for making out of their existence. Rising up is something that cannot be put into you from the outside. It has to come from the inside. Church can set the stage for that. That's why we have Bible school, to set the stage for young people being able to rise up above what's going to happen to them because it requires a spiritual contribution, but it always has to be self-administered. The Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes comes to mind. It is the most pessimistic book in all the Bible. It has this scripture that says, Life is vanity. Now, this writer had lived a little while, obviously. You have to live a little while to feel like that. Life is vanity for the righteous and for the wicked. And then this, all things come alike to all. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, it sure looks like he's right about all things coming alike. To all, all of us, birth and death, joy and sorrow, sickness and health, love and loss, happiness and tragedy, such things are no respecter of persons. In the end, they come alike to each, regardless of position or character or goodness. Now, in my immature hubris, sometimes I think about that and I think that if I were God, I could beat that. If I were God, I could do a better job than that. The good ought to be rewarded and evil ought to be punished. But no, a Malaysian airliner goes down, and the good and evil are not separated. They all alike drown. All things come alike to all. A tornado blows the town off the map, and churches and schools fare no better than crummy bars. All things come alike to all. Hard times engulf the hard-working honest as well as the lazy crooks. The Bible says the rain falls 
on the just and the unjust. Why can't the rain fall only on the righteous? They earned it. They deserve it. Do they now? Jesus taught about that. He told a parable, our scripture reading this morning, about a man who built his house on the sand. And a man, another man who built his house on the bedrock. And the same indiscriminate fury from Mother Nature bore down on both. The lightning strikes and the winds howled and the rains fell and the floods rose. And if that's the end of the story, Ecclesiastes is right. All things come alike to all. But all things don't come out alike because what life did to both of these houses depended on what it found in them. It depended on the way they were built from the foundation up. So, Ecclesiastes doesn't take it far enough, does it? The house built on the sand is washed away but the one built on the rock stands. Likewise, some souls fall apart and go to pieces. But for those who love God can rely on the promise of God. A wealthy man hired a builder to construct the finest home imaginable no expense was to be spared only the best will do but this contractor had a bad habit of shaving a few corners you know cutting cutting a few corners and make a little extra it's easy to hide stuff like that there's lots of ways and from a distance after he was finished the builder looked at the house and was pleased overall But then the owner said, the home is yours, but you have to live in it. And all those places where he cheated started staring out at him, and he realized how much better he would have been if he built it right. And he would have built it right if he'd only known that it was his destiny to live in it. Now, you have to live in what you build because life is what you make it. Make yours one somebody would be proud to live in.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Lord, make me, even me, an instrument of your peace. Amen. Happiness is a journey, not a destination. So work like you don't need the money. Love like you've never been hurt. Play like nobody's watching. And leave the rest to God. Amen. Amen.